Hello guys, welcome to another episode of CUDA Education. Uh, today we are going to go over a simple um, algorithm that does strictly compute work in the Vulkan API. Um, this is part of the series of examples that um, <clears throat> were made available online, open source and free to the community to use. Um, if you're interested in installing these examples and having it run on your Windows-based machine with a Vulkan-capable GPU, um, you will have to um, <clears throat> get tutorial number one and tutorial number 13, if I remember correctly. Uh, those two tutorials will walk you through installing the Vulkan API and also um, installing or getting the these examples to run. And as you can see, there are many examples here, okay? So this is CUDA Education. Um, you could check out all our tutorials on uh, Amazon. I'll have a link below. I'll have a link to tutorial number one and tutorial number 13 below. I'll also have a link to the original code um, that was provided. I, I made slight um, modifications to this, mainly deleting out things that are not relevant to me, just to make the code more readable and accessible uh, for, for the tutorial I'm about to do and, and, and the discussion I'm about to, to um, go through right now. Now, as I said, this is a simple <clears throat> compute algorithm. And basically what it does is um, you will, you know, rebuild the, um, <clears throat> you rebuild the algorithm and then you run it. And all it does is it, it's a vector of about 32 numbers ranging from 0 to 31. And then Vulkan takes those numbers and basically adds them up. Um, two elements at a time uh, until, until, you know, and, and, and dumps the results in a, in a vector that is then displayed on the screen. So um, if you see here, um, basically this is the result here. I have a GeForce 1050 Ti. Um, this is me, Q family count three. That's something I just added in. Q, Q family count three. Anyway, so this is the input. This is the vector that, that we sort of create. So zero, one, two, three, all the way to 31, 32 elements in total, starting from zero. And then you basically add the first two elements. So zero and one is one, and one and one is two, and two and one is three, and three and two is five, etc. as you get to this, right? So, um, <clears throat> That's basically the, 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 the algorithm, but um, the reason for this discussion is just to walk through how, how it's done. Now, I'm probably going to do two separate videos, so this will be labeled part one, and then I'll have a part two. Uh, main reason being, number one, I don't want the video to be too long, and number two, um, there are some later sections that I kind of need to uh, work on a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is a great way for, for you to understand and learn how Vulkan works yet again. Um, the tutorials available on the, the Kindle store, um, most of it focuses on, on creating a triangle. Um, and it's a triangle, um, you know, standard issue stuff. Anytime you're creating a new, you know, doing a new language, it's sort of the hello world of, of computer graphics is to create a triangle. So... It walks through the steps of all the things that need to be done to create that triangle. Um, but, you know, obviously it's not enough because Vulkan is, is a, lot of, a lot of moving parts and a lot of things happening. So my strategy going forward after having, you know, made, made all those tutorials, you know, and, and have it accessible and everything. Um, my strategy going forward is to uh, basically you know, go through a lot of these examples. Um, obviously, Compute Headless is the one that um, we're going to be focusing in on right now. But I think my strategy going forward is to just go through these examples um, and, and, and sort of discuss what's happening in each of the algorithms. And, you know, by doing that, you know, everyone learns. Um, right now, for this, this first kind of format that I'm working with, you know, it's going to be freely available on YouTube uh, through this video, but, um, you know, maybe for the, for the other ones going forward, I, I might put it behind the, 
the Kindle, um, Kindle ecosystem wall or what have you. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm yet to decide. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the, the more information that's out there on the internet about Vulcan, the more information, um, you know, different people take stabs at it and, and, and sort of try and explain what's happening, the, the better for, for the community, the better for everyone. Um, <clears throat> there's also CUDAeducation.com, C-U-D-A-E-D-U-C-A-T-I-O-N.com, CUDAeducation.com. And uh, there's a lot of resources and stuff on there. Um, and I want to shout out the, the creator of this, um, the original algorithm. Obviously, as I said, I, I made slight, mod I deleted out some debug stuff and whatever. But um, these, out, these, 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 these examples here are, are very helpful uh, for the community, for, for people who are, are really trying to, to learn the Vulkan API, including myself. Now, uh, full disclosure, I haven't been, been, been programming Vulkan for 100 years or 20 years or anything like that. I am a lot like you guys. I'm trying to figure it out myself. Um, and I'm just, I think that the value that I add is that I make things, um, you know, I, I just, I, I think I, I could teach, you know, my value is teaching um, and not, not assuming too much information from, from the person that I'm trying to teach, whether it be programming background or otherwise. Um, you could literally, with my tutorials, you could literally not, not have programmed ever in your life and just through the videos, um, get somewhere and, 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 and start programming in computer graphics um, or understanding how it all works and, and everything. I go through everything. I go through the CMake, the, you know, uh, setting up Visual Studio, you know, the, the whole gamut, just installing the, the, the Vulkan API itself, installing all of these examples. I, I don't really assume much. Um, if you, you know, outside of just being know how to use a mouse and click on a keyboard, you know what I mean? Um, so that's, that's sort of where I am. Full disclosure, I'm not trying to pretend to be something that I'm not. Um, but again, after doing the triangle tutorials, I think the next best thing is to kind of just go through these algorithms and um, understand how Vulkan API works. Uh, a lot of, lot of things going on. So anyway, this, this particular, um, <clears throat> this particular uh, discussion now, it, it's, it's an algorithm that doesn't use any computer graphics capabilities of the Vulkan API. We're, we're strictly focused on just the numerical uh, computational side of Vulkan. Now, contrary to popular belief, Vulkan is not only for computer graphics. Vulkan is, the main purpose of Vulkan is parallel processing on the GPU or, or basically programming the GPU. And the, the, the beauty and the curse of Vulkan is that it gives you a lot of control over how any and everything happens on the GPU, which is a blessing because you, you could optimize to your heart's content and you could really get granular about how things work and how you want it to work in the name of speed or efficiency or whatever you want to call it. But the downside to that is that it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's very verbose. Um, even for this algorithm, just, just for this piece here, um, and it does involve a lot of like encapsulated things where, you know, it's, it's calling other files and initializing things elsewhere. You know, we're looking at, we're looking at 500 lines of code, right? Just easy, just for this, but it's all good. Let's not, let's not, um, you know, let's not get worked up about that. Uh, but it is the future. Software is the future. Digital is the future. Holograms, virtual reality. I'm not sure how Meta is doing these days or, or, or the, the virtual reality scene or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, but, but either way you look at it, you know, remote work, um, digital capabilities, it's, 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 it's going to be part of the future. And also, I don't think that Vulcan is going to go obsolete anytime soon. Um, these things are too complex for anyone, for any person in their basement to just wake up one day and decide, you know, they're going to create a competing product. Um, the only really other API I know is, um, is, uh, is uh, DirectX, right, from Microsoft. Um, so there you have it. So let's, let's kind of get our hands dirty and, and get into this. So, so again, um, I'll just run the, um, I'll just run the algorithm again. And um, basically, it's this guy right here. It inputs a bunch of a, a vector with a bunch of elements, 32 elements total, starting from zero, going to 31. And it outputs, you know, adding all of them together. And that's it, right? Um, I have an NVIDIA GeForce 
1050 Ti. I know it's probably dinosaur GPU, but it's okay. It gets the job done, right? Um, I'm on a Windows system. Um, Windows, I don't even know, 10 or whatever it is. Um, and uh, uh, Visual Studio Community Edition. Um, you know, uh, yeah, and, and that's pretty much it. Um, Windows, you know, NVIDIA GPU, uh, NVIDIA, uh, I mean, uh, Visual Studio Community Edition, and I'm able to, 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 to run Vulkan on it and, and basically do what I do. So this thing, I guess the best way to start off is to start with main. So let's just go to main. Right, so um, int main, uh, basically you create a new instance of Vulkan example and you run it and then, you know, press enter to terminate and that's it. So, you know, everything starts, I guess, with Vulkan example, right? So um, <clears throat> these are just a bunch of standard libraries. As I said, I'm, I'm probably going to break this up into two videos, so this will just be the first, first part of it. Um, but yeah, now we have our Vulkan example. Um, and then we initialize a bunch of variables to be used later. Um, and, um, you know, there's a physical device and there's VK physical device and VK device. Um, not going to... I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll need to discuss this later, but just understand that physical, VK physical device and VK devices is two separate things. One is the, the, the full Vulkan implementation, and the other one is referring to an instance, right? Um, but yeah, we have Q family index, pipeline, you know, command pool, command buffer, description pool, um, all that stuff. Now, this channel, we, you know, a lot of this I discussed in previous videos, right? Freely available on YouTube. So, I discussed Q family before. I discussed um, well, uh, well, command buffer and, 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 and command pool uh, briefly. I, dis I discussed descriptor pool, descriptor set layout, descriptor set, all of that I discussed before. So these are just initial variables that, that we're gonna use later. But um, I discussed a fence, which is VK fence, it's, it's for synchronization, all right? So we're just, we're just pretty much creating a bunch of variables now, nothing, Nothing too hard. Um, now we have to create. Uh, this is this is a an outline of a create buffer function, custom function to arrange for the creation of a buffer. So a buffer is just like a space um, that that like a container that that holds memory and it, it it contains specific information and stuff that we could do things. So notice that this this variable this um function creation it has a whole bunch of parameters: usage flags, memory property flags buffer reference memory reference size and data not going to get into it too much right now but but just understand that when we call this um you know generally we need to we need to outline all of this stuff right um right so we need to outline basic container to hold creation information so <clears throat> for, for those of you that have been following the channels for for a while now you know that um, the, the general tempo of, of a Vulkan script is you, you, you do a lot of setup um, and then after you do the setup, you, you submit all that information in the setup to a function and, it, and the function does something. So this create info, you'll see create info a lot, buffer create info. So we're initializing basic container to whole creation information. So we're initializing um, a lot of information using this uh, buffer create info initializer and we submit usage flags and size. Now remember usage flags is here and size is here. Now let's just pause for a minute. Um, if you want, after, I, I hope you guys, you know, will install these examples on your machine and will run it. Um, if you ever want to dive into what's encapsulated and stuff, you could go to definition, go to declaration, and it will take you to all the code necessary for, you know, what these initializers are. I'm not going to do that right now because it's going to throw you off and it's too complicated and it'll make the video too long. But 
Just understand that we kickstart stuff off with this buffer create info and we use an initializer and we submit usage flags and the size, right? Whatever usage flags and whatever size was submitted when we, when, when this create buffer was called. Here we're just defining create buffer, but we're eventually going to call it. So when we call it, this buffer create info will be created. Then now um, we have sharing mode. The, the, the resource will only be accessible by one queue family at a time, no sharing. So um, previous videos, again, we talked about queue families. Um, and, you know, uh, basically a queue family is sort of like a, a capability or, 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 or a series of capabilities that can be done. So you have like a transfer queue family, you have a compute queue family, you have a graphics queue family, you have um, some other, I think like sparse memory or something queue families. But anyway, um, for our purposes, we're saying the sharing mode is exclusive. So only one queue family can actually use it at a time. It's not concurrent or it's not, can be shared among multiple things. And actually, if you guys remember, when I, um, when I ran the algorithm, you see, I, I added in this thing, queue family count three. So there's actually three queue family count, um, of three queue families available with my GPU or what have you, right? My, my system. So, um, but we're saying that, you know, there's no sharing allowed, right? VK sharing mode is exclusive. Um, <clears throat> So here now um, we we fire off the VK create buffer function. So actually create the buffer and store it in the buffer variable. Notice that the VK create buffer function takes device information and the basic create creation info, including the sharing mode. Um, and the basic creation info, including the sharing mode. So what this is saying is um, basically again. We take all of our creation info, including initializing the, the buffer create info stuff and also the sharing mode. And we basically, we, we submit it to the function called VK create buffer. We submit all of this information into, um, into this thing, right? So we have our device, which is sort of, um, what is device? an instance of the implementation, right? So we have our instance. Um, this, is, this is the information that's, um, that we're, we're dumping into the function call. Null pointers, we leave that alone. And then this is what we're gonna call our, the buffer that's created, we're gonna call it buffer, okay? Um, so it's gonna be like the handle for the, the, the buffer. So this is the general tempo, tempo of Vulkan. We do a lot. Well, we do a bunch of setup, and then we, we we make a call. Okay, so that's that. Now that we've created a buffer, we need to associate some memory with it to make it useful. So, uh, you know, a buffer is is kind of like a it's it's like a hypothetical thing. It's sort of like you know just something on paper, something in space, whatever. But, um, you know, to 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 make it useful, we have to associate memory with it. So we yeah we know we have a. Technically, we have a buffer that's like exclusive, you know, one queue family at a time, and, and it has these, you know, initialized information and stuff. Again, if you want to know more about the details of this, you could always go here, right click and go in there. Um, but now we have to associate memory with it to make it useful, because when we have that buffer, we need to, you know, be able to store things in it and put things in it and all that stuff. And the only way you can do that is if you have memory. What are the properties of this complete Vulkan implementation? Notice that we are re referencing the VK physical device type variable and not VK device type variable. So this was something that was a little um, confusing for me, or not, not confusing, but just I needed clarification. So VK physical de device is the whole entire Vulkan implementation. So, you know, I guess that would get into Vulkan version 1.3, 1.4, 1.1, whatever. And then VK device is more the instance, but this is this is talking about, I guess, the whole Vulkan in implementation, right? So, what are the properties of the complete Vulkan implementation? What can it do? What 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 sort of memory does it have, right? What what are the parameters of that memory? What kind of memory can it reference? Things of that nature. 
So we, we, we create this, um, initialize this variable device memory properties as, that is of type VK physical device memory properties. Also guys, if you wanna know about something, all you gotta do is copy this type, dump it into Google, and it will take you to the, the Kronos Vulcan spec and it will give you all the information you need to know about a specific variable type. I can't show it to you here in this video because, or do it here in this video because, you know, uh, Kronos Group gets all, you know, they don't want anyone, you know, sharing their spec and, and what have you and showing their spec online, which is understandable, right? Because there might be, people might abuse it and stuff like that. Anyway, so we, we have this device memory properties of this type. We initialize a variable type and then we do VK get physical device memory property. So now we're trying to figure out what is what is um what is what are the capabilities of this Vulcan implementation? And we're gonna dump that information into this handle device memory properties, which is here. So, you know, again, same thing. We kind of set up stuff here and then we call the function and then you know we have our handle, which you call a handle, just like a handle for a door or a handle for carrying a bag or something. We, 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 we call, we get the physical device things and we dump it into this variable. So this is our handle now for when we want to figure out what is, what is the, the, the memory properties of our implementation and, and stuff. Okay, more of the same. Initialize variables to hold memory related information. So we have memory requirements and memory allocation variable. VK memory requirements, you guys can Google it again. VK memory allocate info. You can still Google that too. And there's an initialization. Again, go to definition, go to declaration, and you could get all the information about this memory allocate info function, right? But memory requirements allocation is actual like, like allocating space and stuff, right? Memory requirements, memory requirements. Pull memory requirements and store in variable just created. So we're gonna VK get buffer memory requirements. So again, same thing. This time we're we're referencing the instance. Um, and um, we have our buffer here, and then we're putting it into the memory requirements variable. Mem, mem requirements is like the handle again, right? So we're getting all the information about the memory requirements and we're dumping it into mem requirements, okay? Uh, we have to submit the device instance and the buffer, right? Um, <clears throat> right, so, um, Again, it's sort of like a waterfall. It's like a cascade of a cascade of, of things that are happening. So, you know, we start we start with the first block, and then we go to the second block, and on every block further down the road is dependent on what was previously done, right? So, <clears throat> we have the buffer stuff up here, and then now we want the memory requirements um, of that buffer, and of course it depends on the instance, and then we have this memory requirements variable that holds all that information. So now we have mem alloc dot allocation size equals mem requirements dot size. So again, the, ca the cascade goes down further. We now have our memory requirements variable. We know what memory requirements are there is. And then now we're trying to figure out the size of the memory requirements and we store it in the mem alloc dot allocation size. Guys, I'm not gonna pretend like I'm an expert in all of these details. I'm just trying to, to get, open the door and give you guys a shed some light on, on the logic of, of, of how this is all working and add, add my insight and two cents into it. Um, but again, it's a cascade. We start from one thing and then we build upon it. So we have our memory requirements and then we, we, we get the size information, mem alloc dot allocation size equal mem requires dot size, okay? Now that we know the memory requirements of the buffer, let us shuffle through the available memory type until we find one that fits the buffer's needs. Okay? So we initialize the buffer. We know it's an exclusive thing. Um, we, we know the memory properties, memory requirements, all that stuff. Now we actually have to go through the hardware um, that we have, the GPU. And we have to loop through all of the different types of memories available um, from our GPU and then find out what the index is of the memory type that works for what we need. Okay? So again, 
we're just looping through like a, a, a for loop, a while loop, well, you know, a for loop. <clears throat> and we're just looping through all of the memory types on our GPU. And we're trying to find the index number of the one that um, fits our needs. That's basically all of this, this thing is, right? That's all, that's, all, that's all this is. So we initialize a variable memory type found. We initialize it a, a Boolean uh, variable to false, right? Because we haven't found it yet. We haven't done anything yet. And then we run a for loop. We run a for loop, basically starting from index zero all the way to the um, to to the to all the memory type, um, all the indexes or all the all the number of memory types on the GPU, and we iterate each time. You know, one one at a time. Zero, one, two, three, whatever. How many ever memory types there is on the GPU. So we go through from zero all the way to all the, all the memory types. Then if the memory requirements, um, <clears throat> if mem type, mem type bips and one equal equals one, um, this is a little tricky, I would say, but basically, um, you're, you're, you're basically trying to match, um, you're trying to match that what, what we're looking for matches what, what, what is in the hardware of the GPU, right? And if it matches, um, is, so if this, if this passes and then this pass device memory properties dot mem type I property flags, all of this, if these two things pass, then we save the index number of the, um, of the memory type index, right? There's a, there's a thing in C++, you have double ampersand and one ampersand. I know that uh, the single ampersand basically forces the um <clears throat> the system to read both sides of the and percent so even if the first one it is false it still reads the second one and all this stuff i am not an expert on on this test right here um or why it's done this way um i'm sure it, i'm sure there could have been a, a more simpler and straightforward way of, of doing these tests but um basically what this is saying is I'm shuffling through all of the memory types on the hardware. And if I find a match, memory property flags, okay? Notice that when we, when we call the create buffer, we have this, um, memory property flags here, okay? We'll see that when we actually call create buffer, this, this is VK create buffer not um right not not our custom create buffer so it's two different kinds of functions this is you know implicit in the the the, the vulcan implementation and this is our custom create buffer function but notice that when we call create buffer we specify the type of memory that we're looking for all right so this memory property flags is the same thing that's down here <clears throat> excuse me is the same thing that's down here. And we're trying to find the memory type that matches what we're looking for. And we have our index, we save the index, and then we change the mem type found to true. So um, once we've found it and we've found our index, basically, you know, we're, we're done. This is another thing that I have no idea all I know is this, this I think means it's divide, division by two or something like that. I'm not sure why this is done. Um, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on, on bitwise operations or all, or all that stuff, um, but that's there. I'm gonna leave it alone. Uh, not, not, gonna, not gonna pretend like I know what this is, but this is there. Um, if you know what it is or why, why it's necessary to do this, please feel free to leave a comment below. Uh, line 115. And you could tell me why why this is necessary or what it what it does. Um, if you also if you also can shed some light on these tests, I would appreciate it. Um, I mean, obviously, I know that here you're trying to match 
the property flags, but like this and this, you know, right. All right, but let's let's keep moving. So now you assert you assert mem type found. So basically, this is just a check to make sure that we actually found memory that does what we want it to do in our buffer, right? We we want to make sure that we we um we found something. Now I'm I'm gonna tinker with this code. Um, and show you, you know, what happens if we don't find a memory type that we need. So basically, I never, I never, um, I never find, um, I never tell the system that we found something that's true. So let's, um, let's do that. Um, and we'll see what happens. Okay. So we get runtime error, abort has been called, assertion fail, mem type found, right? So we now know that um, basically it doesn't, it doesn't work, okay? So let me set it back to true, all right? So now we know, we, we found something and we found something and then we, we, could, we could move forward with that. Um, anyway, so I'll just let that build or whatever, right? So we found something, so now we could run the allocate memory function. Notice that the mem alloc variable in the function and the mem alloc dot assignment above. So, so now we're allocating memory to our situation. Um, again, we use this mem alloc thing, and then we also use memory. Um, and of course, we have our index here that's associated with mem alloc, okay? So now we VK allocate memory. Again, you could Google it and go look, go look at the spec and figure out you know, what all this is. Let's just run our algorithm and we should be back to where we were before, right? So here we have it, right? No problem. All right, so we're, we're good to go. We're good to go. All right, so that's that. No problem. Okay, so... If data was passed into create buffer function call proceed accordingly so this now is a, 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 a test to see if data was passed into the create buffer call okay now let's go back to our original um, create buffer declaration so if we go back to our original create buffer declaration notice that we have this <coughs> void data null pointer Right, and of course you have the, the asterisk and all that stuff. You know, for, for you pointer gurus, you, could, you, you guys could have a blast with it. But basically it's testing if um, <clears throat> data was passed in the function. Um, if it hasn't been passed, it's, I guess, defaulted to null pointer. But if it has, it wouldn't, it, it, the, the test will fail. So if, it, if, if, if data has been passed, then we would, um, if data was passed into the create buffer fu function, proceed accordingly. Then we would run this situation, which is you're basically mapping, you know, mapping memory to device, um, and you're copying over stuff to the device. Uh, let us actually pause here. Um, when we actually, when we actually create the vector 
um, we type it out and we create the vector. We're, we're actually creating it on the CPU side, okay? Um, we eventually have to move over whatever we, whatever, we, whatever we type and create here, we're eventually gonna have to move it over to the GPU, right? So there's CPU side and GPU side. A lot of my other videos talk about it, so it shouldn't be too, too much of a surprise to you guys. Um, <clears throat> we have to move the data over to the GPU side, right? So that's what basically all of this is about. It's like mem copy and, you know, device is GPU, host is CPU. And we'll, we'll see that as we, we go along. But, um, <clears throat> you know, you have to move the data over to the, the GPU or you have to make the, 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 the GPU will be able to see what's on the whole side and all this stuff. But that's basically what this is doing. It's, it's figuring out if data was passed to the function and then it's, it's doing some mapping um, associated with it. Um, obviously, you guys can visit the spec and, and, and you know, Google all of these things, figure out what, what they are. But that's basically what this is. Associate the memory to the buffer object. Note that the memory now contains information passed in as variable data when the create buffer function was called. So again, we're going back to the same situation here. Create buffer function, if we called with some data associated with it, associate the memory to the buffer object. Note that the, the, the memory now contains information passed in as variable data, right? So VK bind buffer memory. We have our device, we have our buffer, we have our memory, and zero. Okay, again, you could, you could visit the spec to figure out VK buffer memory and get all that stuff. But, but like I, I said before, it's like a waterfall. All of this stuff, we're doing a lot of setup, a lot of work, a lot of you know, different things to basically be able to, to, to um, <clears throat> do, 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 make this call right here. You, you can't just make this call blindly. You, you have to do a lot of work and everything to be able to have all the parameters needed to, to make the call successful, successfully, okay? And, and that's, again, the tempo of Vulkan. It's a lot of setup, and then you submit a function with, with all the, your background setup information encapsulated in the call, and you get what you want. Return VK success. Now, we have a close bracket here. If you guys forgot, all of this work that we're doing is just part of the create buffer function, right? Okay? This is just defining the create buffer function. All right, so we're, we're closing it off now. We're, we're done with that. All right. All right, Vulcan example, let's continue. Running headless compute example. Okay, fair enough. And, and we see that when we actually run the thing, right? Running headless compute example, blah, blah, blah. All right. Basic application setup. Um, have at it, guys. I'm not going to go through all of this. Without surface extension. So Vulkan instance creation without surface extensions. Remember, as I said, this is not a computer graphics application, so we're not going to be rendering images to the screen or anything. We're simply doing calculations and outputting the results of those calculations. Okay, so you know, without, without surface extensions. Create an instance. Again, you see we have our create info friends here. Same kind of deal. Layer, layer count, all that stuff. Now, I deleted a bunch of stuff, if I remember correctly. I deleted a bunch of stuff in this piece right here because I, I wanted to, um, <clears throat> you know, I just, I just kind of wanted to focus on, on what we're doing and not, you know, I, I deleted a bunch of debug stuff, validation layer stuff, um, and then Android stuff. So the, the tempo of the code might be a little different from the original thing. But um, yeah, so if you, if you see it a little bit different, then, you know, just understand that that's what I'm doing. <clears throat> we do a bunch of create info stuff, and then we fire our VK create instance to actually create the instance. Okay, fair enough. Nothing, nothing too hard there. Um, device creation, physical device. Um, all of this stuff.
not gonna go through it too much. Uh, create, it's, you know, you can pretty much uh, Google all these things. And then this is where, so, um, remember the physical device now is sort of a, the actual Vulkan implementation. So we have these physical device things. And then we have GPU device properties dot device name. So notice that device properties is really part of the physical device um, situation. So when we actually run, that is how we know that we're, I'm on an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1050 Ti. Okay, so that's, that's how we know that that's, that's what this is. All right. Um, Okay, so now we're, we're, we're requesting a single compute queue. So, we initialize queue family count. VK, get physical device queue family properties. Same situation like before. We submit the physical device, right? Um, we have a handler for queue family count, no pointer. Um, and then we have a vector of Q family properties, right? So a vector of, of type that's supposed to hold Q family properties. And we have Q family properties vector, and then it, it has this Q family count number of elements. Okay. So it's like a container. Tell me how, how many Q families are available. So this was my, um, really, really, really intelligent and smart, um, modification of just <laughs> trying to figure out how many Q families um, I have. And of course, like we said before, I have three, right? Q family count three, okay? So that's that. I just added this in. This is not in the original um, code. Get Q, VK get physical device Q family properties. Um, So we're saving a Q family property. Cycle through all the Q families. So four from zero all the way to the number of Q family families there are plus plus. If there is a Q family that has compute capabilities, save the index number in Q, fam Q family index variable. Um, <clears throat> Q family index variable I. So if the Q family properties, I, Q family flags, and VK cube compute bit, again, guys, the spec will tell you all you need to know, but basically you're trying to match what we want with VK cube compute bit. And if the two match, if this test passes, then we save the index number. And of course, um, you know, we do a bunch of other setup stuff, but we save the index number, Q family index. So Q family index I, whatever I is at that point, is what we're gonna, we're gonna use as the Q family for compute capabilities. Remember, um, request a, a, a compute queue, right? So this is all trying to request a compute queue. So once we get our Q family index, Create logical device, what this video, watch, sorry, watch. Watch this video for more information, right? I go through all the thing about logical device and physical device and instance and all this stuff, right? So, um, we submit for the logical device, we, we submit, um, but we create, create it first, create device, VK create device. And notice that we submit the Q family index here for the Q that we want. So logical devices is again, instance related and notice is VK create device, not physical device, but device, which is instance related. Cause if we remember up top, we said that device, instance of an implementation devices instance right so 
if you just see device, you know that it's um, more instance related. Um, <clears throat> so then we create device, uh, get a compute, use the compute family index uh, to pick out the compute queue family. So queue family index zero, queue family. BK get device queue. So, um, yeah. We need to request hardware resources for our upcoming command buffer. Um, we talk, I talked about this in a video. Um, I'll probably figure out, you know, which video it was, but one, one and I videos, we talk about command pool and command buffers and all that stuff. But basically, you need to um, associate hardware resources. Anytime you see pool, like descriptor pool, command pool, all that stuff. We're talking about getting resources for for like something else, right? So that's what all of this is about. Um, I think I'm already at 45 minutes. I think I should stop here. But um, I did do some comments all the way down here. Okay, so prepare storage buffers. We We have two vectors of size 32, which is what buffer elements was set to above. All right, let's pause right here. Um, Oh, sorry, it's already here. <sighs> so it's already here. Um, so we have two vectors. We have vector compute input and compute output. Okay, so buffer elements. Buffer elements is a constant that was initialized up here. Buffer element 32, okay? So we have that there. So we have our two, we have our input, we have our input and our output. The, the size of them are gonna be equal, but of course, you know, the, the contents of them are, it's gonna change. So fill input data, an efficient way to fill the compute input vector with the numbers from zero to 31. So this is a really fancy way of basically filling the vector with, um, Filling the vector with, filling the vector with, with um, numbers from zero to thirty-one. That's all this is. Okay. We need to manage memory. Thirty-two numbers multiplied by the space required for each number. So again, Vulkan is very explicit, verbose. You know, you have to spell out everything, which is a good thing and a bad thing. But basically, if if we have to save thirty-two numbers, and we know that each number is of a certain size in terms of memory requirements. We have to multiply the number of numbers that we need times the size of each number to get our buffer size. All right, straightforward. Nothing, nothing too crazy there. Device buffer, host buffer, device memory, host memory. Um, initializing variables. Um, now, here is where things get interesting. So now, remember how we created our, we did our create buffer function all the way up here, right? We had our lovely create buffer function. Okay, so now um, what we have to do is we, we actually call it. So copy input data to VRAM using staging buffer. Remember that the compute input vector we created ourselves lives on the CPU side. So this thing that we did right here, this is CPU side stuff. So this vector now lives on the CPU side. GPU doesn't know anything about it. It is not on the GPU side, so we need to transfer the vector and the data to the GPU so that it can read and perform calculations on it. So basically, we're using the Vulkan is a GPU, you know, language and all that stuff. It's concerned with the GPU, parallel processing, all that. So we need to move the data from the CPU side, you know, hard disk, whatever, into the GPU um, memory. So that's what VRAM is. Um, <coughs> If you guys remember, like, especially with the new GPU launches, the big, the big hoopla is how much VRAM does the GPU have? How much VRAM, video, video memory, VRAM, whatever. 
this is what we're talking about. Obviously, the more VRAM the GPU has, the better it is because you can readily access information um, locally on the GPU, which means your graphics application will be faster and things will, you know, your frame rates, I guess, will be higher and all that wonderful stuff, right? You guys go crazy about, about you know, frames per second and stuff, right? So th this is what this is talking about. So our vector is not on the GPU side, so we need to transfer the vector and the data to the GPU so it can be read and perform calculations on it. We use a staging buffer to do this. Watch this video for more information. That's the, that's the, um, <clears throat> that's the, uh, that's a, the, the video right there. Um, but basically you could do search CUDA education staging buffer on, on uh, YouTube and, and you should be able to get that video. Um, it's, it's one of my videos and I talk about, so we use a create buffer function that we defined above. Notice that we are parsing in the compute input vector and its data as a last parameter of the function. This is very important. Last parameter of the function. Right? Um, last parameter of the function, right? Remember this data thing right here? Right? So for our create buffer thing, we're inputting, um, uh, where is it? Right, we're, we're inputting this compute input dot data as the last parameter of our function. Also notice that the initial parameters of the function call are, now also notice what, what the initial, also notice what the initial parameters of the function call are. It is focused on transfer related activities and host visible related memory activities. CPU side visible memory. All right. Our create buffer, right? Go to definition. Right? Our create buffer here. Okay? So see these usage flags, memory property flags, all this stuff right here. Usage flags and memory property flags. All right? that's what that's what those that's what it was referencing it was usage flags memory property flags all right so it's all coming together now guys i know it was all abstract and and we were just like you know i was just talking into the wind and and like i didn't make any sense but now now you're starting to see usage flags we're doing transfer related stuff. Transfer related stuff for the usage flags. Uh, source and destination. Uh, don't ask me the difference of the two right here for this specific situation. But anyway, usage flags, transfer related stuff. Okay. And memory property flags. Memory property host visible bit. Remember when we talk about host in GPU speak in GPU programming, there's host and device. Host is CPU, device is GPU. All right. So basically, the memory has to be host visible. Um, we're creating a container, a buffer, a, a, a sort of a slot, if you will. And then we, we pass in our, all our little variables that we initialized here into it as holders, host buffer, and host memory. Uh, buffer size, we know what the buffer size is because we did the calculation here. 32 elements times the size of each element. So we know what our buffer size is. And then we're putting in the data, compute input data, right? Which is this right here. Um, so, you know, the fancy way of filling in the vector, right? So we're basically compute input, right? So compute input data. So we're submitting all of this information to the create buffer that we spent, you know, basically half the video, more than half the video discussing above. This is, again, the tempo of Vulkan. You do a whole lot of setup, whole lot of setup, just to be able to call a specific function properly without it erroring out or the validation layer going berserk or the, your system crashing or anything. 
the tempo of Vulcan. It's not that Vulcan is hard, it's just you have to understand the pattern and the tempo and know how to create stuff so that you could actually call functions to do stuff, right? So that's that's why you know Vulcan can be verbose and stuff because you have to outline all this stuff. But now we know we're doing transfer related stuff and we know we're doing it, it ha we're, we're dealing with memory that has to be host visible, right? Because of course, you know, we're doing a transfer between host and device and all that stuff for the buffer, so it has to be host visible. All right, flush writes to host visible buffer, so we're basically flushing stuff, okay? Not gonna get into it, but you could always Google the spec to your heart's content. Okay, you have to do this because you have to make sure that whatever is in the host thing is, is, is all pushed out, okay? As again, I'm not, you know, I don't want to digress. We use a create buffer function again. Notice this time the initial parameters of the function call are different, okay? It is focused on storage buffer related activities and also device local related activities, GPU side local memory. So we call our little friend again, but notice that this time the usage flags is slightly different. We have buffer usage storage buffer bit, okay? You guys can look up the spec to what this is, okay? I'm not going to get into it. And we still have our transfer dance over here. Um, notice that now the property, memory property flags, whatever, is different. Memory property device local. So th this is basically saying, hey, I need a buffer local to GPU memory, right? Because the GPU needs to readily access all this information so that it could do stuff, calculations, everything. We have our... Um, Variable handles, device buffer, device memory. Oh, where do we, where do we, um, oh, okay, right. So, right. So see, device, device, GPU buffer, GPU memory. Host, uh, CPU buffer, CPU memory, okay? So on the second one, now we're, we're, we have our handles for the GPU buffer and GPU memory, right, for, from this call. So this is like more of a CPU side call. This is more of a GPU side call. Remember, buffers are containers and all that stuff. So I guess you could think of like this is a container on the CPU side. This is a container on the GPU side, something of that nature. Um, <clears throat> Copy the staging buffer. I have a whole video that talks about this, and I'm not going to go through it again because I did it a while back, and you know, there's a lot of like little details and minutiae. But if you watch this video, you, you could sort of um, follow along with the commands that are being made here. Um, most, most notably, of course, we have to allocate begin command buffer, end command buffer, and we do a copy buffer thing. So you have the buffer on the CPU side, and then you're trying to move move all the, the information from the CPU over to the GPU side, but there's like a staging buffer that's in the middle that like temporarily holds stuff between the CPU and the GPU, and it's faster to do it that way, and all this stuff. I mean, it just it's just it's just like Fourth of July fireworks, guys. You, 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 can't, you can't go to the circus and, and, and be more entertained. It's, this is just way better. Okay, like way, way better. So um, the other thing too, I also talk about this, is that you have to have a fence. Um, I have a video here that talks about fences, but basically what a fence is, is synchronization between CPU and GPU side activities. So um, uh, this is... I think this fence is basically to make sure that um, if you submit a request or you, you submit a transfer from CPU to GPU that it doesn't um, keep, keep requesting it or keep, keep 
doing the activity until it gets a signal that the first step was completed. I have a whole video on fences and all that stuff, right? I kind of remember a little bit more about this because it's, it's, um, you know, it's something I, I, I really like to, you know, I really enjoy about Vulcan is the whole synchronization thing. But basically, um, the, the, the fence discussion is to, is to make sure that, um, you know, you, you don't move on to the next step before you're finished the first step. So, for example, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't start operating on the data that's transferred over into the GPU until the transfer itself is finished right something like that so or you wouldn't keep requesting um or keep keep submitting transfers um until you you, you get gotten signal that the first transfer is done you know things of that nature but again you could google the spec and and work your way through all of this 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 code right here but that's that's basically what the fence is about um and then you submit to to the queue Again, you know, we still, again, we still have to deal with the fence situation. You destroy the fence once you're done, and you free the command buffer once you're done. Um, this is the point of the story where I'm going to stop, because I have to go figure out everything else down here. But um, always remember, guys, good housekeeping. You, you, you clean up after yourself. Uh, you, have to, you have to destroy and free up stuff once you're done with them. So you, you don't eat up memory or, or create, create adverse conditions or unexpected behavior because things are just dangling all about in your system, right? Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that's, um, that's, that's pretty much where I'm going to end. Um, I'll, I'll just real quickly. So I, I, I start, we, we prepare compute pipeline. Uh, we talk about descriptor pool. I have a video on that here. Um, descriptor layout, all of this stuff. Um, but you have the compute pipeline, staging buffer object. Um, you know, all of this stuff. Um, this synchronization stuff, it's, it's definitely a, a beast, but um, you know, I have a video on like um, synchronization or release and acquire source mask and destination mask. So we have our source and you have your destination. One is write and one is read. <clears throat> write and read. Write and read all that stuff, but basically, um, I stop here for the time being. Um, so the big picture stuff after this is compute pipeline, create pipeline, staging buffer stuff. Create command buffer for compute operations, fence for compute command buffer sync. <clears throat> you know, it, still, still a lot of stuff that we have to, we have to cover. But, um, and you know, a lot of this stuff, buffer barrier, a lot of this stuff is sync related stuff. So you have to make sure you're doing things in the right order and you're not, you're not reading while you're writing or writing while you're reading. Um, and then once you're done, you output everything, which is what we see here, right? Compute input, compute output, and then end. And then you clean up for yourself, destroy destructors, and then that's it. Anyway, guys, um, I, hope, I hope at least where I took you to right now, um, was helpful again tutorial number one tutorial number 13 if you want to have this code running on your machine you definitely definitely you know get tutorial number one get tutorial number 13 have it running on your windows based machine with a vulcan gpu um vulcan capable gpu um 
and 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 do like what I'm doing right now, you know, just just playing around with stuff, you know, seeing stuff. I I do I, I will advocate for reading the spec, but it's way more powerful to read the spec and also have running functioning Vulkan code on your system where you could change parameters, you could change um, you know, different things in these calls and see how it behaves. You know, see what happens when you change stuff, all that stuff. So that's all I'm trying to, I'm trying to help people to do. Um, I'm not sure when I'll have the next video up. It's going to take me a little while to, to, to work through everything else. But I hope that this was helpful. There's a whole bunch of other, um, whole bunch of other examples. So even if you're not too thrilled about compute only stuff, there's a whole bunch of other things that, that you could do. My, my free YouTube videos has, um, you know, uh, me running some of these examples and everything. CUDAeducation.com. I'll probably have this code, you know, my version of this code where I just delete out stuff. I'll probably put it somewhere eventually. I don't know yet, but I definitely will have a link to the original code um, that is available on GitHub, right? Freely available. Um, so, you know, you could look at, look at that too. Um, and um, I guess I will... I will include um, links to the YouTube videos uh, down below also, so you guys could at least click on it. But kudaeducation.com, check out the, the, the Vulcan series on, 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 um, on, on Amazon. And uh, yeah, guys, uh, don't, don't get discouraged. Uh, honestly, I believe that Vulcan is really, it, it's, it's really interesting. It's really powerful skill. And the thing about it is it's so involved and stuff that like if you if you truly master this these this 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 stuff you you will be very valuable in society right because computer graphics whether it's in business whether it's in engineering whether it's just in user interface design whatever the fact that you could you could you could do stuff down in 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 literal code you know ray tracing is on the scene now um holograms, virtual reality, that's the future. So if, if you just spend the time to learn this stuff, it, it's going to be very rewarding for you in the future. Um, learn how to use Visual Studio. Learn just, you know, how to use the different tools to even get, get, get Vulkan to run. Just be familiar with pointers, all of that stuff, function calls, um, memory, buffers. It's, it, you know, you can't, you can't really, I think, I think computer graphics is probably the hardest, one of the hardest things you could do, especially when talking about parallel processing, it's probably one of the hardest things you could do in computer science. So if, if you, if you could conquer this, you could, you can't, you know, no one can, can, um, you know, no one can talk to you. Um, and, and it's not only just the programming part of it, but optimization. So uh, GPU is parallel processing, but there are a million ways to do a parallel process. Um, but the, the key is to make it fast. But in order for you to make it fast, um, you have to really make sure your synchronizations are right because you can make it really fast, but your, your, your calculations and your solutions are wrong. Or you could be very right, where your calculations and solutions are very right, but the program is very slow because you're, you're very conservative and careful in when you do things and how you do it and, and you know, over-synchronizing and you make it slow. So um, this, this is future-proofing yourself. Um, I formally, you know, I, you know this, this technology is not, is not going away anytime soon. You're, you're going to be very relevant in some part of the world with this technology. So um, <clears throat> for you guys that love video games and stuff, yeah, play your video games, do all your, all, all, all your stuff. But, you know, take some time and learn how, 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 how these video games are created. Learn, learn about drivers. Learn about, you know, um, memory buffers and synchronization and frame rates and device local memory versus CPU side memory. You know, all of this stuff. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Have a great day.